I got the, the design uh, bed going on here um, and I haven't slept that much my, my, my hair looks like shit uh, last night I hit the wall to be honest man I was like man a lot, a, of, a, bit. a lot of energy went into uh, that incredible set that we just made mm -hmm. shit Look, it's uh, exciting times. We've got some incredible sets coming through. Obviously, part of the misfell is, as I've said during the keynote and other times, uh, is the set that I'm the most proud of that we've made yet. I think you, rightfully so. And you had a big part in that as well. We worked Thank together you. during that initial uh, uh, vision design and the early design phases. And uh, I know you uh, pushed back on some of the things that were happening early on and tightened up some of the, the scope on stuff, yeah. which uh, was, was good. I was thank you for for being that harsh master, that counterbalance to some of the outlandish uh, things <laughs> that I try and push through. Yeah, but that's that's like a good flow, right? Like you yeah. always want to push the boundaries as much as yeah. possible and then some asshole has to be the fun police and be like, ah, it's a little too far. Yeah. And break oh, oh you bit. folks out there need to thank... Uh, or be Ryan, angry at me, maybe. Who you knows? know, for, yeah. for, for raining me in sometimes. But I think uh, we worked we worked incredibly well together on this one and created something really beautiful. That, as, as I say again, it's the set that I'm the most proud of yet yet is the is yeah. the key thing that we're looking to do better we got some we got some good stuff coming through uh, sure. into the future no i think uh the the genesis of this product is really interesting and then like there's aspects of it that can only come from you because there's so much that like we sit down to do a set and you're like here's this thing i thought about 10 years ago or 15 years ago <laughs> or 20 years ago and you're like now's the time to do this yeah, yeah. do you remember like the first kind of seeds like I guess not only deciding that this set was going to be when we head to Mysterio, but just like going even back further than that, like how you envisioned the first time we went to Mysterio, because it's been something that fans have been asking about for a long time now. Yeah, obviously there's an expectation that we're going to go around uh, each of the eight regions, like like immerse into those regions. So uh, our, our, our venture into Mysterio was a long time coming, um, and it is a very loved region of, of the world. Uh, you know, it features in the original law book, so there's like some good... Um, you know, foundational source material to be drawing from. That damn law, lore book on the table, they're always holding us to it. They're always looking for the next thing in the lore book every time. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, but it is good. Like, when you come to create a set like Mysterio, like, literally, you, you turn to the lore book. That's where I started. Yeah, yeah. yeah to, to go and, um, uh, you know, refresh your memory on, on what uh, that foundation is that has already been established and draw inspiration from it. And, um you know, each of the eight regions has their own uh, you know, unique talent, right? Like Solana with light, Demonstra with shadow, and so on and so on. And, uh, you know, the intention always was for Mysterio, their talent, to be mystic. So the, the starting point was really about crystallizing what it means to be mystic and really locking in the definition of that, which is moving through different states of being. And once you really, like, lock that in, then things start flowing from it. So yep. uh, it's very important to understand that moving through different states of being isn't going to different dimensions that's that's a shadow thing like shadow is is playing around in different dimensions that exist within the constructs of reality you know the, the tapping into the ethereal and things like that pulling things through you know dimensional portals mystic is not that mystic is very much in this world the world of wraith but but energy and other forces and elements moving through different states of being. Um, so one example is your inner chi, mm. you know, which is a, a very real world concept, yep. right? Um, that we all have this this energy flow within us. And uh, you know, th there's people in the real world who, who really are very serious about it, even in medical professions like acupuncture, uh, which I get a, a fair amount of myself to <laughs> maintain my uh, bodily functions. But... Uh, this concept of chi and this energy and being able to, if you are really in tune with it, direct it into different different ways. And even, you know, there's some beliefs about being able to manifest it into, mm -hmm. into things, as you see with Zen, uh, our ninja. And when, when we planted this seed all the way back in Dynasty, you know, you and I worked together on that in Dynasty, and we knew that we would flesh out this concept of, of manifestation of chi in with our ninjas, it's into this this essence of these uh, like chi formed you know tigers that they are able to, to sort of like bring uh, bring out from within. And you look at something like Enigma, and you take this inspiration of the moon. A moon is something that moves through all these different phases, mm. um, you know, through through different states of being. Uh, and I think it was a very beautiful 
uh, concept there. Everyone can relate to the moon. Everyone looks at the beautiful moon in the sky open, right, and, and sort of admires the full moon and the waiting moon and waxing and so on and the, the new moon, uh, very important, the yeah, new moon. Absolutely. And just moving through those phases and cycles and, and different states of being. Um, so that was really, I think, the core of the genesis is, is really zeroing in on what it means to be mystic, finding inspiration from the world around us and then applying it to our game system. Let's talk about kind of first drafts of Chi. Because that, yeah. that's the biggest mechanic we have going here, I think. Oh, this, yeah. this transcendence, this creating this new resource type, representing that new resource type with the Chi symbol. First drafts were very different. Mm. And actually, I think, resembled kind of like the hisses and slithers that ultimately uh, became news forte. Yeah. She was a more, uh, I guess, like simpler mechanic in a lot of ways. It was, it was a lot more safe. It kind of just resembled uh, very much still this creation thing. You're creating these things in your hand, but it wasn't always about resources. Do you remember the moment where it was like, okay, this has to shift to resources. And then that, like to me, I, that shift is where the meat really got on the bone mm -hmm. of this set and where things started becoming, I, I think you used the right word, beautiful, because I yeah. do think it's a beautiful set. Yeah, very much so. Um, so there's kind of like three typical things that we turn to when creating these um, uh, components within our, our sets. There's plus power, plus action points will go again, and plus resources, right? And you see in something like heavy hitters, heavy hitters with might yep. agility, um, and figure, and you know these are the, sort of the three the three components that we look to deploy in different and interesting ways in many of our products, not all of them, but many of them. And when uh, we started with the, with the initial designs of uh, part of the misfile, you know, you had your uh, your slither and your hisses, which are you know your plus ones and your your go agains, um, being created like the crouching tigers. Like the, I guess crouching tiger was sort of the the, the, the starting point, right? Like this is how you manifest these uh, uh, ephemeral things. And, and then the, the natural next point was the hiss and the slither. And in the beginning, the, sliss, uh, the, the hiss and slither was something that we were sort of thinking about making available to all of the heroes in the set. And as we worked through that design process and refined things down, as we always do, uh, we found, uh, you know, the, the, the more deliberate and specific application of that but then the resource one that we, you know, was also this thing that you manifested in your hand. It's a little bit more tricky though, like manifesting a card, a whole card that just creates one resource was finicky. It didn't, it created a lot of baggage and all of a sudden we had like a million tokens that needed to be in the product. Extra and sleeves next to your deck and it, yeah, like the mechanics of it were getting off somewhere. It was just a, a rough edge that wasn't good enough for our standards. It was okay, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't good enough and we're always striving for simplicity. With design and with development, that's that's you know the hallmark of, of good game design and development is always striving for the most simple form, and that wasn't good enough. So uh, I know you yeah, you were very uh, uh, you know sh strong in your opinion that we needed to, to keep searching on that one, and I'm very glad that you did. And again, it was about okay, that's that's not good enough. We need to go back and actually think about the fundamentals of what Mystic is, what this product is about, which again, moving through different states of being. Well, what's one really, really key thing about that or, or, or meaningful thing about that is, is this concept of transcendence, a very mystic thing, uh, a, a very big part of a lot of the um, the, the Asian, uh, you know, even religious systems, you know, like, uh, you know, monks and, and meditation and things like that, this concept of, of, of transcendence or reaching a transcendent state. And thinking about this concept and it, like really spending a good amount of time thinking about it and reading about it. And it just, like I, when I think about transcendence, I think about something which is like moving upwards. It's like an elevated state of being and trying to apply that experience to the game pieces just maybe want to keep like lift, lifting the thing up, yeah, like moving yeah. it upwards. And that's when it dawned on me that, hey, what if we made these cards that transcended and they you literally physically move them up off the table, elevating them upwards and they become something else. They flip into this inner chi, this thing which is inside you. And then that thing which is inside you, this thing that you were 
you, that you're trying to transcend towards, it is you, it is from within you, and it goes back into your deck, and it's like you capture that essence of it coming from within, still being within, but you're now in this elevated state, and you get to you get to really experience that through Tap the whole pitch me again. mechanic, yep. which is very unique to flesh and blood. And uh, something that I'm always super excited about when we, when we discover these moments of mechanics that you work towards in the game. They're not there at the beginning, but they're quests that you go on and you achieve them in the game, and then it somehow modifies what you're able to do, elevates what you're able to do, mm -hmm later in the game. In other game systems, you know, you kind of like ramp your resource base into some big end game payoff. For Flesh and Blood, it's a very, very different game system than what generally exists in the market. And But there's still really elegant things that we sometimes come across and, and discover or intentionally like put into the game's uh, design where you're working towards a, a longer term strategy or game state that pays you off later in the game um, and I think that Chi is one of the really really beautiful ways that we've been able to deliver on that. Yeah it's so cool how it involves the experience of playing your hero throughout the game because yes you now have unlocked these powerful abilities that we've put on these heroes and equipments also unlock some defensive liabilities Chi's don't block very well. Yeah. You can get Chi flooded. Like yeah. it just it changes who you are as a hero once you've gone through this process yeah. of transcendence. And I think that's so cool from a design perspective. And I love that you mentioned the actual physical lifting for transcendence. Because to me, and the thing that I will absolutely die on the hill that Flesh and Blood does better than any game I've ever played, it's the tactile experience. Mm. And by that I mean just the way you move around your cards, the number of cards you hold, like it all just feels very satisfying to me. That's obviously a very subjective thing, and everyone's going to look for their own tactile experiences. But to me, I had exactly that moment where the transcendence just felt right. Like I was physically making the right motions yeah. to feel like I was transcending. It's important. Yeah, I think it's incredibly important and actually uh, an underappreciated aspect of design. Getting back to the design of these transcend cards, they kind of unlock something for us, right? They let us make a type of card we've never made before. And it's an effect so small that you usually wouldn't be able to put it on a flesh and blood card because it would be yeah. a complete waste. When did you realize like this was the cool space we were going to get to explore where we were able to make a card that just says shuffle? One of the coolest pieces of text we've ever put on a card, by, by the way. I was so excited. It makes me so pleased when we can find um, useful places to put these micro effects, right? Like, like you say, you just can't justify putting a card in your deck that just shuffles mm -hmm. or typically just plus one something and they're like that's it and doesn't even defend you know or even even it's a quite a hard ask to put a card in that all it does is give something go again mm -hmm. um it, it's a real Every card's valuable in flesh and blood you know particularly when uh, when the the cards don't even defend that that offer those effects um i mean like lunging press is a good example it's like it's very hard to justify putting a lunging press in a flesh and blood deck um, like it happens in niche occasions, but it, I mean, and again, for lunging press at least defense for two. Yeah. So when we find opportunities to put these micro effects into the game system uh, and make them like legitimately playable cards, it, it it is a very satisfying moment because look, it's easy to make some stupid, dumb, you know, power creep, over the top card. Like it's easy to make those. It's hard to make compelling, subtle effects. And you can remember, commons need to be subtle, compelling, like the cogs within, particularly limited formats. Uh, you, 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 you have all of these constraints when you're designing a great product, right? Like you've got to have these different layers of power essentially sitting within uh, the product. And, and certainly like at, at your commons, they need to be providing the frameworks that everything else is built upon. And these Transcend cards um, do that. Yeah, yeah and I... I think folks are now experiencing that uh, for some of the very first time. This will be airing after the conclusion of the world premiere. And you can see how they really do just let this limited format have a very different feel to it. It's very different than anything we've done in Flesh and Blood before. And it's so, so exciting. We could talk more about broad mechanics forever. Like literally, we could sit here for eight to ten <laughs> hours and just talk through this stuff. But I want to hit on the all-stars of every Flesh and Blood set. The heroes. Mm. It's always about the heroes. It's always what everyone wants to talk about. Of course, three heroes in the set. We have Enigma, we have Nu, and we have Zen. 
Is there one hero that kind of stands out to you as your favorite? I know it's very hard to pick a darling when you're putting, mm-hmm. like they're all your children in some yeah. way, but is there just a, like part of the design process where a hero really spoke to you or like any, anything that makes one hero stand out above the rest of the crowd here? Uh, yeah, it has to be new just because of how unique she is. And I think when you think about assassins, the typical trope is daggers and stabbing people in the dark shadows and all of that, you know, sort of underhanded, uh, you know, stab by stealth type stuff. And I, I just, from a flavor and creative perspective, I'm just so happy with this character that we created with New. There, there is more than one way to assassinate somebody. Absolutely. Like, daggers are legit. That's all good. But just this concept of uh, infiltrating somebody's mind, their dreams, their emotions, slowly manipulating them and, and lulling them into this sense of, of vulnerability. And then finally, G, transcend, use all them. these secrets you've revealed to me against With you. Your own secrets. Yeah. Yeah, that they have divulged, and yeah. uh, I just think it's such a, a an incredible, um, uh, just yeah, embodiment of this this succubus concept. Um, so I'm very proud of of creating new. I think that she's uh, an incredibly exciting hero. We've we've seen on some of the uh, on the the Blitzdex gameplay videos just how exciting she can be when she uh, gets to that end game state and just deploys your opponent's banish zone. This, and again, it's this thing that she's been working slowly at across the, the course of the game. And I think, again, it comes back to that, that succubus, uh, you know, trope of just like slowly, just one card at a time, just one visit one at a time, here, one, one dream at a there, time. Yep. Yeah, just one, you know, emotion, one seed that she plants at a time. But then eventually when the time is right, the chi comes down and boom, you know, she... Uh, she just uses everything that she's picked from you. It's the moment. You. It's the moment from the trailer, right? Where yeah. She goes, Look at me. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's that moment yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, the, it's, the, it's like the climax moment, right? It's just, she's been building to this this game state, and then it's like boom, like that's the climax moment, and it's like it's not good for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I. Yeah. New is. It's uh, it is so hard to pick favorites, but yeah. New is my favorite hero in the set. Yeah. Um, and it is for a lot of those flavor reasons, like just very very on point from a design perspective i remember that ability and you presenting that ability to us in early design meetings and i was just like this, well, this can't happen this is ridiculous <laughs> like surely we can't play all of these cards for free yeah and then we played a lot with it and it's like yeah, yeah we can do this like it's, it's gonna be really powerful yeah. but like you have agency as the opponent you can try and protect your blues yeah. uh you know you they are blues so yeah. there is some limitation but you know the first time you get Terra Sundered into Macho Grande, you're yeah. probably going to keep those cards out of your deck against New. Like yeah, you for, learned that lesson pretty quickly. For, for real. And look, I think um, a Guardian is a very strong class in Flesh and Blood, just intrinsically by, Historically by design. Always, yep. And I think that having something that can prey a little bit on these big blue bases that Guardians bring to the table is is good for the game yeah. as well. I like just forcing them to aside. Yeah, forcing <laughs> them to adapt a little bit, I think is yeah. a very good thing. Yeah, and, for sure. You know, when you just jam all your blues into New, yeah, she trounces you. Like, you're, you're not going to yeah. do very well. Yeah. Alter your deck a little bit, yeah. t- find a different yeah. approach, and you can hang. Yeah. I, don't, I don't want to talk about Enigma a little bit as well. I am really pleased with Enigma. Sure. Um, I think that we've learned a lot from our Illusionist heroes over time. I think that this is the Illusionist that um, is the most interesting and reasonable. Um, there is... I think that our, our Illusionists are incredibly popular. They're just massively, massively loved around the world, and... Uh, I, I, I am very fond of Prism and of Um uh, but from a gameplay and game experience point of view, I think that Enigma is our best designed illusionist yet, and I say that from the perspective of the opponent playing Agreed. against the illusionist. Agreed. Um, it does not take away the agency from the opponent. The opponent can mostly, mostly deploy their normal gameplay into Enigma, and it kind of puts the onus on the Enigma player to navigate the game state 
whereas our previous illusionist, it was kind of the opposite of that, where it puts the onus on the opponent to add this burden of complexity of navigating the game state that the illusionist player had deployed to the board. So I'm really pleased with the way that we've crafted Ward into the illusionist kit. Um, Enigma, as you know, you gave the star ratings to those blitz decks as our first five out of five. Kano also has a five out of five. Okay. I forgot about that for a moment. Okay. But I mean, like, look at the two heroes we're putting sure. on fire. Surely yeah. the two most skill testing heroes. She is a complex hero to play. She is not a complex hero to play against. Yep. Uh, and I think that is a great place to to, to place her. Yep. Yep. Awesome place to assign complexity. And yep. I, I think you're exactly right where it's, it's just asking a different question of your opponent. And frankly, like if you're a hero that just does a bunch of damage, that's all you have to do. Like yep. that challenges Ward effectively. And if your damage numbers are high enough and Enigma can't account for them, then sure, she'll prevent some damage, but she's not actually gaining traction in the game. And you just go ahead, deploy your game plan, you know, look for some tech cards. Maybe you do need some damage can't be prevented effects, very powerful against Enigma. And that forces her to play in different ways. The dance is really beautiful mm. with Enigma. It feels like a real paradigm shift for how these illusionist matchups play out. Uh, I like that as the Enigma player, you need to understand when to try and defend the board site that you have built yep. and when you just need to let it go what, what do we say know when to hold them know when to fold them yeah, that's, the way. <laughs> yeah, that's the way we always yeah. approach enigma yeah. and it is a, a hard hard lesson to learn honestly yeah. you really have to know this hero inside and out and i love seeing it in our dev team you know there are some devs i, I think of like jason Lai, who have just immediately bonded with this hero just see it as their baby they work so hard and their gameplay is always evolving. And to me, that's one of the big hallmarks of a successful illusionist. They should have almost unlimited skill cap yep. for the player playing it. And uh, Enigma delivers on that for yeah, sure. For sure. So one more hero to talk about. It is, of course, Zen. Mm -hmm. Zen is kind of the odd duck in this trio in a lot of ways because it is just that chi ability carrying Zen. Yeah. But what, what a chi ability. Really, really powerful stuff to get both your tiger and your combo pieces. And, of course, some real powerful combo pieces in the set, relying on crouching tigers as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, I feel like he is the, more, the most grounded of our heroes. He's, he is the hero which is, I would, you know, for lack of a better phrase, say is, is typical flesh and blood. Mm. Um, and I think he should be the go-to hero for people maybe uh, looking for a more, more simple option from this suite of, of heroes from Partham as well. Yep. Exciting nonetheless. Um, getting to search your deck is always is something that TCG cool. players love, getting to search your deck and find the card uh, for, the, for the, the spot that you're in. Uh, and he's really powerful as well. And it is very satisfying to be able to uh, turn one chi into two game pieces. Like, that's satisfying. Um, so yeah, like, I'm really pleased with how he came out. And just look, making good on the Crouching Tigers that we planted into Dynasty. Like there's a lot, there was a lot of foreshadowing in Dynasty and we're slowly sort of working our way through it and making good on things like Nitro Mechanoid as an example. And now you see Crouching Tigers getting the, you know, the, the full treatment. Um, yeah, I, I think that the Zen landed in a, a, a good spot, a more simple spot and a, a very satisfying spot. People love when we give up the inside information in these things. Do you want to reveal who Zen was during the bulk of development? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. I think it's a good story. So, yeah, Zen was um, originally intended to be Benji coming of age. Um, there were two reasons that didn't eventuate. One is that well, the dev team really doesn't like uh, spring tidings that is a for fact. CC. That is a fact. Um, the bigger reason was that uh, the creative team uh, wanted Benji's story to be something different than what Zen is. So, mm -hmm. uh well, I hope that we can do more with Benji in the future. Same. It's just, I think it's a good check-in because I know there are Benji fans out yep. there. We're thinking about Benji. Yep. Like at some yep. point, Benji will find his way back around, yeah. I think. Yeah, Spring Tidings, though, is um, yeah, a card that... It's uh to plan around. Yeah, I, 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 don't know, I don't know how that one's going to fit into CC. We'll see. We'll, we'll figure see. it out. We we'll always see. do. We always figure it out. Yep. Speaking of figuring it out, how about that expansion, expansion slot in the set? I, I really do feel like this is the moment where, you know... Some stops and starts with the expansion mm, slot. I am mm. proud of a lot of the cards, but yeah. I, I think we missed the mark on a few of them. I think we're getting it right at this moment in time, and we really understand what we want to accomplish with this yeah. expansion slot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, expansion slot is a is a new thing for us, uh, as of bright light. So it you know it takes a little little bit of time just to sort of work out exactly uh, how to get the most out of 
a new thing like the expansion slot and you know I think there's, there's been some hits and misses like you said from from the previous expansion slots things like Time of Imperial Flame were very deliberate in what they were supposed to be doing and has proven to be a very successful card there's been other expansion slot cards that have been filler chaff whatever you know just kind of like blah um as of part of the misfiling going forward we are being very deliberate with every expansion slot card yep yeah, they are very uh they're crafted for specific reasons and all of the expansion slot cards um with maybe the exception of uh the 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 Mirai guy dust which is another topic but look we want to keep making cards that support living legend format as well and you'll see that going forward and uh you know there will be uh applications in for dust in the future i can guarantee that i've said to everybody that there will be another Dragonic Illusionist eventually and uh, Dust will will be something that uh, you will want to have in your collection. Um, but even in the meantime, you know, like Living Legion is a format that we'll, we'll be supporting and you'll see some announcements about that coming up soon. It's Exciting a very important format for the future of Flesh and Blood. It is a format that we're committed to. Uh, and we are really just getting started on how we're going to be supporting that. Um, but yeah, coming back to the topic, look, all of the other expansion slot cards, I think, are, are very deliberate. You know, things like um, Visit the Golden Anvil opens up completely new ways to build and play that hero. And, and frankly, to the way that you can build and play Flesh and Blood just full stop. It allows people to do things that you haven't been able to do before. Yeah, totally Vis new mechanics there. Visit the Gold Main Estate is a card that, I mean, Victor doesn't really need any help. Right? He's doing very, very well. But Fair. Visit the Gold Main Estate is... Uh, uh, it offers a new way to build that deck if you really want to go to extremes. As, as we know, I don't want to spoil the journey of discovery for people. You can go out there and, and figure out what I'm talking about on that statement. But uh, just as a baseline, it's just a good card to put in a standard Victor deck as well. For sure. Um, you get the Shadow Realm Horror, Horror which is a, 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 just a fantastic Levi card. Shout-outs to Chris G about... Chris Gearing for for yeah, he nailed that up one. that one. He nailed that one. And I think that's such a quality card to have in this slot because I, I think back about Dust Till Dawn. Again, I think a set kind of like Dynasty that's going to be vindicated by time and yep. maybe didn't exactly nail the mark coming out, but certainly these heroes have gotten themselves into a better place. And I think about a lot of the stuff we did for Leviah in that set and there were really, really quality cards. Of course, the Demi Hero, huge mm. splashy effect. But I think a lot of the cards required you to have a really in-depth knowledge of Levia mm. to be able to leverage them and to be able to appreciate them. Mm. And in retrospect, I wish we made more cards in that set that made people say, now I want to play Levia. Yeah, this yeah. is a card that says, yes, this looks powerful. Now I'm going to learn this hero as opposed to niche tools for the people who already had that mastery. And I think that's exactly what this Levia expansion slot card does. It makes you want to go out and just learn this hero because you see the power facially on this card. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. With, um, yeah, no, Chris, Chris brewed up a, a beautiful card with that one. Yeah. Um, what else we got? Like the, the eloquent eulogy. You know, it's just, that's just a no-brainer. Any, anyone who likes playing Vincent is, is just over the moon to have your first Ring Gate 1 card. I think back to the gentleman who accused us when we did the dev, dev panel in LA of not loving Vincent. And I just want to say, yeah. <laughs> see that Ring Gate 1. You see it. Yeah. We love Vincent. We Vincet's do. That's going to be taken care yeah. of. James in particular, you're a huge Vincent fan. Absolutely yeah, massive absolutely. Vincet fan. Yeah, yeah, you'll, you know I am. You'll message me at 3 in the morning, look at this Vincent deck I brewed up. And then I'll, I'll wake up groggily and look at it and I'm like... I don't understand this. I have to engage back in the morning. So yeah, no, we've got big, uh, you know, big hopes and plans for Vincent. And um, look, we were we were modest when we shipped Vincent. We didn't want to put another chain intentionally. Out. So intentionally, yeah, intentionally, yeah, we didn't want to put another chain out into the world. And Vincent, she'll she'll get there. Um, but yeah, look, I'm pleased with the expansion slot. Oh, actually, uh, Supercell was another card I want to talk about. Mm. Max Max Knight. Supercell was a card from Bright Lights that got always present in Bright Lights uh, through almost the entirety yeah, of development. That, that got uh, it didn't make the make it through development. Yep. Um, it's a very very powerful card. It didn't make it through because it was deemed too powerful at at the time. We wanted to take a little time with it, understand yeah, Max yep. a little bit better. We did tweak it a little bit from some of those early uh, iterations, but I think it's in a good spot and it uh, addresses a couple of the big. Uh, challenges that Max needs to overcome to deploy his gameplay. One being getting to the critical three hyper drivers, mm -hmm. um, and the other weakness being that when you boost away all your nitro mechanoids, it's, it can be tough. Yeah, 
Absolutely. So we, Speaking uh, of boost and key cards, how about getting those singularities back to as professor? A yes, couple very you know, key pickups for those yeah. uh, bright lights heroes for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, like, look, it wasn't an uh, accident that we shipped uh, Teklavosin with no Icam Bear. I mean, I know even in Dev, uh, some of our um, devs were, were, were dipping into rusted relics and whatnot mm -hmm. during Dev. And, you know, whether it was right, whether it was wrong, we did ship it out knowing that it was soft or wizard. Yep. Just, it was. And look, uh, we were, had it up our sleeve that we were going to make Arcane Barrier uh, Evos or base equipments as well. And, uh, you know, here you go. Here's, here's your set of uh, AB1s that also has some very relevant effects, like you say, of being able to recur that uh, singularity that's been boosted away. But also enables the aggressive Tekla Boston strategy as well that mm. is interesting it's fringe but the aggro boost uh, assemble the four evos as quickly as possible and then start just pounding with those three nines it's, it's scary <laughs> when Teklo gets online early yeah. it can be a really terrifying yeah. aggro deck which I know is weird to hear given how Tekla is kind of positioned around singularity but yeah. those speedy blue evo equipments at instant speed yeah, yeah. Tekla can do work and start yeah. just firing those you know, three cost nine overpowers yeah. over and over yeah. and over. Yeah. There's there's still meat on the bone when it comes to Tekla, yeah. for sure. I yeah. think players will have a good time continuing to explore that hero. But I think this is exactly what the expansion slot opens up to us. It's <laughs> just, it gives us a little bit more safety and comfort, honestly. Like, we don't have to push a hero to the moon right out the gate. We can collect a little data from our players, which, you know, just the realities of these development cycles we work really hard in our development cycles our team pushes themselves really hard we care a lot about outcomes but there's only so many of us and there's only so many games you can yeah. play in a day and you know within five minutes of these cards being released to the wild the world has played more games than we were able to in yeah, development yeah. it's just a reality we're always going to face yep. uh, so having some of these safety valves and knowing we don't have to wait to the next mechanologist set yeah. to go ahead and patch some of these weaknesses. I think it's just a very, very valuable tool for flesh and blood going forward. And it's going to allow us to just continue to deliver on the promise of these heroes as time goes on. Absolutely. I mean, we have a great love for all of these heroes that we create so much time and effort and energy goes into these heroes, both from, you know, the, the flavor and creative process and the storytelling, but also from the, the mechanical design development, you know, our team are playing, you know, with these heroes day in, day out, Monday to Friday, nine to five, just pouring their heart and soul into trying to craft heroes that are compelling, interesting, engaging, balanced, which is, it's a tough ask. It's a, it's a big tight ask. We're always walking a tightrope. You know, also trying to predict what the future looks like as well with the, you know, heroes that, you know, trying, trying to map out their, uh, their journey to living legend and what the actual metagames will look like. And, you know, that, that's really tough as well because it's always contextual, right? Like, uh, something is only overpowered in the context of what else exists around it. So, you know, it's a big ask on, on the team and we really put so much into, you know, yourself on the team put so much into into the development of these heroes that we really care immensely about them all. And uh, the expansion slot is a, a way for us to make good on those heroes that maybe need a little bit of a catch up or a little bit of extra love. Um, so I'm really pleased with how expansion slot has, has, has come about and Great. how we're uh, applying it as we as we move forward. Yeah, I think one of the biggest innovations in Flesh and Blood over the last year is the introduction introduction of that expansion slot. Other stuff that we've introduced, a lot of cool variants, a lot of cool things for collectors in Part oh, of the yeah. Mist Vale, including maybe something like <laughs> this golden pack here that oh, I think yeah. players are starting to get a look at. I'm going to hand this one over to you. You All can right. go ahead and crack the one open. But while you're doing that, why don't you tell us a little bit about just some of the treatments mm -hmm. we see in this set. There's so many cool things going on with Part the Mist Veil. And it's a great set at its core. And then it's got all these goodies on top of it, too. Yeah, sure. So, look, we really value our collectors out there. Uh, you know, a lot of the people at Legends for Studios are big collectors themselves. Um, you know, particularly uh, Chris, Chris Gearing, uh, you know, uh, lead developer and product engineer he's you know a massive collector he just really cherishes and values uh, the collectability of of flesh and blood and and other tcgs across the span of his life as well and uh you know he's you know always talking to me and thinking about different ways that we can inject more collectability and desirability in, into the game um something that we you know obviously very proud of is all of the marvel um transcend cards and being able Beautiful to really cards. honor that that uh 
you know, uh, uh, contemporary uh, interpretation of some of these classical Japanese art styles, and I think it's it's been done so beautifully. Uh, but something that we were talking about for a long time actually is is having this concept of the hidden hidden hero, and part of the misfile just made perfect sense because a lot of like the, the, the story about Mysterio is it's shrouded in the mist cloak, right? And you see that through some of the game design as well, like the cloaked equipments and things yep. like that. A lot of uh, mystery, you know, uncertainty. Absolutely. Yeah. And what better way to, to showcase that at its pinnacle than having an unknown, secret, hidden hero hiding beneath, beneath the mists. So that's what we're going to have a look at right here in this gold pack. Um, as you say, the, the world should... We already know about this, yeah. uh, thanks to the world premiere running this weekend. Yeah, so I, I think just adding that, like we talk about it from a collecting standpoint, but it, there's something to be said too from just a, I am opening this box standpoint. Yeah. What can be in here? Like what kind of treasures am I going to pull? And this is actually quite hard to open. Those little ones are tough. Yeah, because you don't want you don't want to damage. You don't want to hurt it. You yeah, you might have one. something nice right. in there. Yeah. Should probably use some scissors. Anyone got some scissors for me? <laughs> scissors in the room. Can, can we cut this pack open? Yeah. So for all you folks watching from home, your uh, your your Belgian print, part of the misfile. It does have paper gold <laughs> gold <laughs> packs. You can easily tear them off. Uh, our, our Japanese produced flesh and blood will have paper packs soon as well. We've been working. Uh, we've been working really hard with our exciting announcement. Yeah, with our um, manufacturer in Japan to get to get paper flow wraps uh, on onto all of our products, so we'll be there soon. But anyway, please use scissors when opening your- <laughs> Be careful, your, your use Japan scissors. Your Japan gold packs. Yep. But anyway, let's um, let's have a look. What have we got here? So inside this beautiful gold pack, which is uh, something that it's, it's uh, I don't know, how many, do you can remember how many boxes? Like one in- It's pretty rare. It's, like, it's, pr it's pretty rare. Yeah, it's, it's, you gotta open multiple cases to find one of these yeah. gold packs. So they are, they are pretty rare. I, I haven't opened one yet, I'll say that. Well, I haven't even opened it. Have you actually been opening? Yeah. What the? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I helped us out with the QC, so. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that I, makes I sense. a little bit. I, I haven't opened any part of the misfile yet. So anyway, we have Two spectral shields. Beautiful with spectral different shields. Different colors. Way. I think there's numerous different colored spectral shields. Mm -hmm. And then we have the hidden hero. And as I said, the moon passes through many phases. Mm -hmm. And one of those phases is the new moon, the beautiful new moon. So this is Enigma New Moon, a uh, unique hero only found in the gold pack. Yeah. I, th I think it's so cool to just have this last surprise for our fans Absolutely. as we go through part of the Miss Vale season. Um, and we're making good on one more of those dynasty things, the, the uh, Celestial Kimono, the, uh, the Diadem of Dream State. Yeah, yeah. All of these. This, these, hero's, this hero's real, man. She's real. Yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is a very, yeah. very real hero we have found uh, yeah. throughout our development so, process. So. All those cool uh, equipments with Ward. Mm -hmm. Now you can start the game with them face down and turn them face up when it's good for you. Yep. A little bit more control <laughs> over the situation. Yeah. I've, I've enjoyed playing this hero quite a bit. Uh, yeah. Hopefully I will soon get the experience of enjoying opening one of them as well. Absolutely. Very cool thing to happen. So this, um, this one that we uh, opened is the Rainbow Foil one, but there is, of course, the Cold Foil so, Marvel. So I hear. Enigma, New Moon. So I hear. They are very, 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 very rare though. Yeah. So do keep an eye out for that. If you do, if you do open the cold foil, that is something to yep. be treasured. Absolutely. Uh, hopefully I will be able to share my experience of opening the cold foil next time we sit down to do this. And I, I do hope we get to do this every set. I think uh, the fans really appreciate just kind of getting this behind the scenes peak. And I know it's something you've wanted to do for a long time. Yeah. You are the busiest person on the planet though. So it does kind of uh, restrict your ability to sit down for a podcast, but I promise everyone we will get James in here again, Thank you. especially if you're kind to us down in the comments section where you <laughs> tell us how much you enjoyed this chat and we'll be back with more here from legend story studios yep. in the future. Thanks Brian.